Al-Qaeda here, which is called Haram al-Sharif in the Palestinian discourse. And the Temple Mount and the Jewish nationalist, religious nationalist discourse, where also the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock is located, who should have the sovereignty over that? The principle has been since 1967 that each religious um, institution has the control. So the Jewish rabbinites have the control of the Wailing Wall and this whole area. And uh, up here, it's the Islamic Wall who has the control. But the sovereignty, the national sovereignty, that's the beginning. <coughs> and some say that the whole, the heart of the whole conflict is located to this area. But different ideas have been discussed. We come back to that. And the other key issues, of course, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, on Judea and Samaria, and the Israeli will cover that. So how much of this territory should go to the Palestinians? And one proposal that came in 2008 as late as 2008, you had for the first time really a concrete on the table uh, idea, which is very close to the Stockholm <coughs> document of 95. You have here white areas of the West Bank, where you have 90 95% Israeli settlement. They would be annexed with the state of Israel. Then you have smaller settlements, all these triangles. Most of them would go according to this proposal of Holman in 2008. But what should this area be? Stated? Holman proposed it. Yes. Why did he propose? Because he's um, the desert uh, Ariel Sharon who collapsed in a mm. stroke had the idea that very similar to this one. And Holman continued. And then this proposal was discussed almost became accused for corruption and to resign as prime minister. <laughs> so every time whenever I close, something happened on the inside in Israel. But these are the key issues. And to these areas, the Israelis accepted that the Palestinian refugees would return from the refugee camps in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and other places. But not inside Israel. That was the key issue for many of the refugees. But that's basically the best offer so far but has not been accepted by, by both sides. The whole breakthrough came, however, thanks to a track two back channel talk uh, between Israelis and Palestinians. And one can ask, why, what did John Burton and Assa and the others, when they developed this track two talk model, think of? What is the difference in relation to track one? Well, one of the big problems with track one is that they usually, the top leaders, only, you know, stay with different kind of positions in their talks. They never really disclose what kind of um, underlying needs that are linked to the issues. Because by explaining your more weaker, softer side, security needs, identity needs, and so on, it, it becomes too tricky for top leaders to talk about that. Uh, for instance, if you think about the religious places when they just say it's our Israeli national security interest at the control of Eastern Jerusalem. Yeah, but why? Well, and it's linked to religious needs, it's linked to security needs, and ma many things, which a top leader never would say. So John Burton and Edward Asaro began with these kind of problem-solving workshops and realized you need to find a way where they declare to each other on what are the underlying needs for why you want certain aspects to happen in a certain direction. And by coming to that point, um, that's when you really can elaborate ideas and suggestions, which includes both sides' underlying needs. And that's what they call them the win-win solution. It's not only them who developed it. Mm -hmm. Have you read the, the book, Getting to Yes? when I give a recommendation on how one should come forward, Princip <coughs> principled uh, discussions, right, where you really try to identify why you want this particular issue to be solved in a particular way, the underlying needs. We had a deadlock 
obviously, uh, the first Intifada Palestinian uprising, mainly unarmed resistance against Israeli occupation forces. And it really shifted the mood on both sides. <coughs> For the first time in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, the clear majority was recognized uh, the idea that Israel would be recognized, had the right to exist, but that Palestinians should have a statehood in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. A two state solution was clearly on the table. They also said that the PLO were the sole representative of the Palestinian people. On the Israeli side, for the first time, you had a shift from what they previously called status quo, that we would never negotiate about the West Bank and Gaza. All of a sudden, you had a majority on the Israeli side for negotiations with the arch enemy PLO and Arafat himself. So something had changed here. That was also the reason to why Itzhak Rabin came to power in 1992's election. You had promised the electorate that within 12 months they would have an agreement with the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Not necessarily the PLO. He, he, his idea was to have agreement with local leaders from the West Bank and Gaza. And his idea was at that point an autonomy plan for the Palestinians in the West Bank or parts of the West Bank and Gaza. <clears throat> but when he came into power, he began to talk with the Syrians first, secretly. He was almost on the way there, but it, it went wrong in the end. But these secret negotiations almost took a whole year, and he had promised the Israeli elect electorate that he would come up with an agreement. So he really was out of time. But he was extremely lucky, because his second man, the Foreign Minister Shimon Peres, he, he had already started secretly, without the Prime Minister's no knowledge, a back-channel talk in Oslo. And this is what basically became the Oslo One Accord. What had happened? Well, it all began uh, with um, a Norwegian couple who realized, what many of us who are in the conflict resolution business, that the Israelis and Palestinians, when they talk, they talk like this. They never talk to each other, but aside of each other. And when you are from the outside, you can hear, okay, the Israelis speak about security needs, personal, state security, and so on. While the Palestinians speak about justice issues. Can't they somehow speak to each other and find a common solution? And th that was basically the Norwegian couple's idea. Um, the wife of, of um, the woman, Mona Yul, she was at the embassy in Tel Aviv, the Norwegian embassy, so she had a very good network among the Israelis. While uh, her husband, Tarja Rød Larsen, he was a sociologist in the West Bank and Gaza, and very good contact with the Palestinian side. And from there on they came to the idea that maybe we should <coughs> try to find a back channel where They're not an official way where all media comes in and, and checks what's going on. And that we then, in a secret way, in a smaller group, really try to elaborate some of the key issues so that they listen to each other's needs. That, that was the basic idea behind Oslo Channel. So um, they knew then um, some academics who were dealing with all kinds of civil society meetings with the Palestinians. At that time, it was also complicated. The Palestinians who met with Israelis could be seen as traitors and could be killed by their own. Uh, but these, there were particularly two academics um, that I had good relations with, and these academics had a very close relation to the deputy foreign minister of Israel. And that's how the whole process began. So they said, okay, let's try to find a formula where the PLO secretly goes to Oslo, not the top leaders, not Arafat, definitely not, and let them meet some Israelis and see where they can come in their talks. And that followed very much the principles of Burton and Azar. So they sent three people from the PLO who were closely related to Arafat, but definitely public figures. Uh, I mean, when I speak with Palestinians even today and ask what they knew about Abu Allah, who became the chief negotiator. No one had ever heard about him, but he was a close 
close person to Arafat, so he was the perfect person to go on the mission to Oslo. The Israelis sent then the two professors, academics, to Oslo. And the idea was that if it comes out in the media, we can always say that these were two crazy professors who tried to talk with the other side. It's not the official Israel that is in Oslo. So that was the formula for bringing them together. And it was really built up in Oslo, in a nice location, round tables, good settings, good food, just to create a good atmosphere. But it all began, officially they were invited for a seminar, an academic seminar, talking about the future of the Middle East. And um, one of the persons, key uh, keynote speaker, she didn't know that there was an ongoing back channel talk. And she was the wife of the foreign minister of, of um, Norway at the time. And uh, when I spoke with her, Jared Larsen, about what happened at that point, and said she was talking and talking, and all these Wales and Palestinians in the room, they were just waiting that she should end so that they could go and start talking secretly in the hotel. <laughs> But eventually she came to an end and they could then secretly go to the meeting rooms and Tiger Red Larson basically told them, okay, now you can begin talking. I will leave you and only if you start fist fighting then you can call on me and then the talks were starting. And immediately, I mean, uh, anyone who knows something about back, back channel talks, grassroots talks, civil society talks that have been going on during the 80s even, and between Israelis and Palestinians, know that they know each other quite well. They know what their positions are. And that also came to the point in the Oslo talks that they quite soon could agree on some basic principles. And that follows exactly the recommendation of, of Burton and Azar. And one of the principles was we should begin with things we can agree on and leave the tougher issue for later. Not that we take them out, but begin with some things where we feel that we can move forward together. Um, another principle which actually had been discussed in some other talks was that uh, it should be a transitional uh, process, meaning stepwise changes, not everything at once. And the Israelis were very happy for this because they knew that this would give them the, the chance to decide more and then the power on when each step <coughs> has been fulfilled. Uh, but that's what they agreed to. It was also so that they decided that Gaza was one of the first areas that they would discuss in terms of giving Palestinian autonomy over the civilian affairs. So the idea was to transfer the powers from the occupation forces to the uh, um, Palestinian authority who would take care of civilian affairs like education, health care, and so on and so forth. <laughs> that, that was the, the two, three first principles they could very quickly agree on. Then, of course, we have to decide on how long the transition period should be, what other issues we could not agree on, when they should be brought up in the process, and so on. Uh, but, but from that day one, the talks went quite nicely forward. <coughs> and that can be quite disturbing then. After some while, they began somewhere in January 1993. And uh, when one, two months start moving forward, then the P Palestinian side said, well, look, you are two professors. Who are you really? Who are we really talking to? Is the Israeli government behind you? Or is it just a show? And that, of course, uh, made them quite nervous on the Israeli side. So that was the time when the Prime Minister of Israel had to be informed about these secret talks. And that was basically about the same time when Rabin felt, oh my God, the time is running out. I need to have a deal with the Palestinians. So that's when Shimon Peres told Itzhak Rabin that we have some ongoing talks in Oslo that actually are moving forward on, on, on those issues that you promised to the electorate that you will solve. 
And um, when he heard about it, he actually exploded of anger. <laughs> and I don't know if you know how it's like I didn't was he was chain smoking all the time. I think he had two packages in half an hour or something. He was so angry. But eventually he calmed down and realized that was the only option he had left. And pragmatic as he was, then he, he listened to the talks. And um, it was the deputy um, foreign minister, Shimon Piers, and um, I can't remember his first name, Singer, the lawyer to Rabin, who actually already had been involved in the Camp David One talks as, as the one who writes the text on the Israeli side. And that was a man that Rabin really trusted. And they told him, now you have to convince Rabin that these talks and Oslo are the best. This is also what happened, that the Israeli side sent two officials to Oslo and took over the negotiations from the two professors. There was a little bit tension within the Israeli team at the time because the professors felt that they were moving and they were making peace with the Palestinians. Now they had to sit in the back seat and accept that they were secondary in, 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 in importance. But uh, the singer, he really interrogated um, the Palestinian side on many of the issues that had talked in Oslo. And when he was convinced, that's when he also went to Rabin and told about the key issues. And he told that it seems like we have a transitional period. It seems like we can take it stepwise, which means that we have the upper hand in, in the process. And it seems like they're willing to move forward. Uh, so one could say when the two officials entered the talks in Oslo, that's when it's really upgraded. You know, have direct talks between the two sides, informal, back channel, not the top leaders. But the top leaders were there behind. So you can be assured that for every step that Abu Ala's chief negotiator for the Palestinian took, he had to phone or fax to Tunis, where the PLO headquarters was, and ask for permission of Arafat. And Arafat he had this famous style of negotiations, which they called, labeled sometimes as the salami tactics, which means that you take one slice, and when you have one one, you try it for the next slice. One next, the next. So every time when you think, now we have agreed, then he increases the stakes. And if you then have a very cozy, good relation as negotiator in Oslo, where you have good salmon and other stuff, uh, and then again, your chef, your boss, is increasing the stakes. And you sense that the other side is getting tense and saying more and more no. You come towards some sort of crisis. This is exactly what happened in Oslo. That the top leaders, they, they became harsher and harsher from the outside, while the team in Oslo had been, become so close friends with each other that they were almost angry that the leaders pushed them to, to further stakes. Um, and there was one point when it really came to the super crisis and Abu Ala was shocked that Arafat asked for, for even more. So he became so furious that he actually said, now I resign. And they had a real crisis in, in, in Oslo. Uh, because the Israelis didn't know first, well, what, what's this? Is this a trick by Abu Ala for the negotiations, part of Arafat's strategy? Or is he really sincere that he wants to resign? And it's clear that Abu Ala was furious at Arafat at the time. He was really ready to resign. Uh, and then everything would have faltered. But the Israelis then uh, said to the Palestinians, okay, if you can't agree on the small issues, let's agree on the very big issues. And they realized de facto they were sitting together for months and talking with each other, which means that de facto, indirectly, they have already recognized each other's existence and right to exist. So why not come into an agreement that we will officially recognize each other and right to exist, as well as that we decide to be our its other's enemies and that we will politically come to our final peace agreement. That's something of course the Palestinian would very much love to hear 
and also Arafat liked, because then you had achieved what they tried for so many years, that the arch enemy also saw PLO as the sole representative of the Palestinian people. And that paved the way. So in, in August, the media had started to get something, some rumors that something was going on in Oslo. And Rabin was often pressed in media conferences that they say that you are talking with the PLO, our arch enemy, and so on. And he denied it completely. But on the 13th of September, they went to Washington to sign the Oslo Accord. Yeah. And that is from there. Uh, when Bill Clinton, even the Americans didn't know about these talks, by the way. They knew it, but they couldn't believe that they would go so far, because the Norwegian asked ahead of the talks, is it okay if we try to talk, bring the Israelis and Palestinians together? And the Americans said, sure, don't involve us, it's so complicated, they didn't believe that this would work. But they were very happy when, when they realized they had succeeded and that the signature would be coming here at the White House lawn. And here again, you have top leaders' importance for sealing a deal. It, it was a track two, or one and a half, so to speak, but uh, it had to be officially made, uh, signed by the top leaders. And um, Rabin personally hated Yasser Arafat. He had so much difficulties with him, personally. But he knew that it was probably important to shake hands with him at the White House. But he told Clinton, please make sure that he doesn't kiss me, <laughs> whatever happens. And there is a true story when Clinton in the Oval Room tries to exercise with two of his advisors on how we should move the people in front of the camera mm -hmm. in case Arafat wanted to kiss Rabin. But it never happened. <laughs> but you can see how Arafat is stretching out the hand, waiting for Rabin's hand. And then Rabin takes it. And then he almost tries to pull it back when Arafat just continues to. But symbolically, it was very important. You saw the crowds in both Israel and the Palestinian areas in West Bank and Gaza sharing this agreement. You had 70% in average on each side supporting the agreement at that time. Because they recognized each other as enemies. So that's what you can achieve with a track two back channel. One of the problems is of course exactly what I said that the negotiators themselves become so close that they almost are ready to run away and go much further than what their top leaders or the public could accept at the time. They had a very close relation, those five people in Oslo. Actually they became four, seven in the end. Uh, so they were ready to go get give in much more than what the top leaders were. One of the key issues here was should the Palestinian authority be labeled? Is it an autonomy or as the Palestinian wanted, statehood? None of them were acceptable for either side. Autonomy was too closely linked to the Israeli side and statehood was too far for the Israeli side. So one decided to use the word self-rule for the Palestinians. That was something they could accept as in between on the way towards something. And the idea was that the transition period would be five years. And in the end of five years, they should have a complete settlement on how the Palestinian areas should be, uh, what they should be called, what kind of status it should have, and the borders and so on. And one decided that the key issues of the conflict should be talked about later in the process. And that's why we spoke about Camp David II talks. Uh, well, they didn't manage to settle it. But they did talk about the talks in Stockholm in another um, back channel talk. And they continued also to develop the Oslo Accord, so they expanded the territorial area which the Palestinians controlled. And basically the map today looks similar to this one. Where you have an idea that the Palestinians 
in the bigger cities, Kamala, Jericho and so on, there you would have A area where Palestinians have full control, B area, the yellow areas, should be joint control with the Israeli side. And at that time, you could see how Israeli and Palestinian security, military vehicles were driving together on the road, patrolling what was going on. Unbelievable sight at the time. C areas are the remaining blue areas, 70% at the time. Today, they are around 60%. So there's still many key issues left because the Palestinian side claim that we gave 78% already to the Israeli state in 1948. The remaining 22% of historical Palestine we must have. While the Israeli side considered the West Bank as open for negotiations. They have completely different positions here. But that's where they are, which also was brought into secret talks. They continued in Stockholm in 95, and they, they came closer to an agreement like this, where basically the Palestinians would have 100% of the West Bank and Gaza. So everything that Israel takes on the inside, the Israelis would compensate with areas of Israel property. So it's equivalent to the 22% of historical Palestine. That's the best deal they have so far, but officially it's not recognized. Now they're probably further away from each other than ever before in history. But it shows that you can come quite far on technical solutions concerning key issues via the track 2 model. At this time when things were moving in the end of the 90s started to become more tricky but it was still a sense of that it might be moving on to a final agreement. And now I will talk about my own experience. And I was phoned up by someone, can't name the person, and asked would you like to help us to make peace between Israel and the Gulf states? It's not that kind of phone call you get every day, so you start thinking, oh my God, what do they want now? Um, but the idea was to make a back-channel talk um, between the Israeli side and the Gulf states. And the thing is that uh, anyone who knows something about the League of Arab States knows that Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, particularly Saudi Arabia, would probably be the last state to recognize Israel. Although there was some sort of little attempt by a prince in 1981 to give an idea for how one could find a solution here, uh, Saudis had very be, been very reluctant. Now the idea was then to bring them together. How could one do that? How should one organize this? <laughs> um, so of course I looked at different kind of back channel talks and also looked very much into the Oslo model of how <coughs> one could do it. Uh, it was not only two delegations here, we were talking about seven states from the Gulf and together with the, with the Israel that should be having a different kind of bilateral talks in somewhere, in Gothenburg, <laughs> of all places in the world, not Stockholm, which was of course an advantage because in Stockholm you have much more media attention and so on. Nobody thinks about little Gothenburg and so on. So how do you organize it? Well, we thought that we will organize some sort of uh, uh, academic seminar in public where we will talk about the visions of the new Middle East, where you speak about regionalism, regional integration and stuff like that. It was very much popular in the 90s. And uh, I knew also that Israelis would very much like to talk about these things. But this would be some sort of umbrella uh, coming together. <laughs> But in reality, we were planning something else. Why we booked <coughs> on various hotels and places in Gothenburg um, rooms where the, each pair from the delegation, Israel and the Gulf, each Gulf they would meet in secret. That was basically the idea. 
And we had a lot of preparation works on the key issues that were between the two, each pair, so to speak, from the Gustav as well, uh, which was of concern for them to be handled at the talks. And then, um, of course, you also have to locate the right people in each country. I mean, if you come to a prince somewhere in Bahrain and then you approach someone who's absolutely hostile against Israel, you, you disclose everything that comes out. So you really have to know who you would go to and really talk. I remember still how I had a long list of names from where, somewhere. And there was one name, um, uh, Prince Abdallah of Saudi Arabia who was assumed officially to be a hardliner but inofficially open for the idea of have some sort of reapproachment towards Israel and have, have some sort of agreement. So that, that's one of the key players that we try to contact. And you, I mean when you go there and you have to write nice official letters with the right wordings so that they would be interested um, it was a long preparation process and also when you try to organize something how do you fix it I mean to have another conference on, on regionalism at the time was not so easy to get funding for but I had some good contacts with some organizations here in Sweden and just phoned them informally and said if I need X certain amount of money for something I cannot say exactly what it is <laughs> be ready to give <laughs> <laughs> And if it comes out in the media, we will ha will have hell. And the person said, okay, you have the money tomorrow, no problem. <laughs> Why? Because they wanted to, so eager to be part of something. Many Swedes were irritated that the Norwegians had succeeded with Oslo, because it actually started in Sweden. I didn't tell you that story, but that's a fact. Uh, so the money was there, so we could organize it. And we had prepared everything, and sent letters and checked with our contacts and everything was on the way to be launched uh, for the first talks. Then we had reached the 28th of September 2000. And what happened on that day? Someone knows. The Al-Aqsa Intifada broke out. The Palestinian <coughs> uprising, a lot of violence. So no Gulf state representative came. <coughs> it was disaster, we had to close. And fully understandable, it was impossible to come while there was full fight, which shows again how the Palestinian issue is always linked to the other issues in the Middle East. But um, there was an escalation in the Al-Aqsa Intifada in the spring of 2002. The parties came to a really critical situation in the West Bank and Gaza. Israel um, went in with military force and reoccupied many of the Palestinian cities at the time. It was really the worst time period of, of, of the conflict in the Al-Aqsa Intifada. That's when the League of Arab States had a meeting in Beirut 2002. And guess what? Pren Prince Abdallah had become King Abdallah of, of Saudi Arabia. And what did he propose in Beirut? A peace deal to Israel in the middle of the war. We said, if you give back the Palestinians to West Bank, in the Gaza Strip, with Jerusalem as its capital, uh, then all 22 Arab state members will recognize Israel, and we will have a full peace. So all the three no's from 1967 were wiped out. It was totally agreed by all Arab state members. Until this day, Israel hasn't really answered or, re or responded to that peace deal. So there is a peace deal also from all the Arab states, which in many ways was linked to this track two talks. But Prince Abdallah, who later became king, he really went further and, and made it a public track one from track two, so to speak, to track one uh, proposal to the other side. And one could say in many ways that United Nations UN Resolution 1397 that was taken just shortly after this came up on the agenda is identical almost that there should be a two-state solution the only thing that the resolution says is we leave to the 
parties themselves, the Israelis and the Palestinians, to decide on the details. But the details are Jerusalem, they are the Palestinians and so on. They are the key issues. And they are not going forward because they don't talk with each other today. So the question is, can we have another back-channel talks at the moment <laughs> uh, in order to come around the deadlock on the top level situation at the moment. Well, both sides have in many ways made it more tricky because Netanyahu has made sure in his government that a law passed in the Knesset that any kind of back channel deal that comes forward must be go going to a referendum. And that's quite, you know, then it's dependent on what the people say. I don't think it's so bad actually because the day when there is a deal <laughs> on the table, usually people turn around and, and support. But on the Palestinian side you have something similar. Hamas has said if if there is a deal that is similar to a two state solution, we must have a referendum and if the Palestinians say yes, we will accept as well. It's not what we like, but we will accept. So, in many ways, you can have back channels talks, but it must be uh, accepted by the broader publics on both sides today. Uh, I don't think it's bad, because the day they actually will come up with an official agreement, which the top leaders have signed, usually tends to be that the, the people follow. But remember what happened in Colombia when the track one talks ended, which were secret, back channel uh, they didn't get the support by the people in the first round very much because the deal had too much of uh, amnesty components God knows how, how the Israeli-Palestinian deal will uh, tackle those kind of reconciliation issues uh, but of course there will be a risk uh, if they don't tackle it in a good way because there are many people on both sides who say that well we cannot forgive what happened in the past. We have been having the conflict too long. So if we don't have that in part of, of an agreement, there will not be a public support. Anyway, um, I gave you some examples from the Middle East um, on how track one and track two have been applied in the past, what challenges they have, and that the track two very much has been on some sort of critique against the track one's um, problems to come past to, to, to a deal, particularly when there are complex conflict issues involved. It's better to start somewhere on the grassroots and go upwards. Um, but it also shows that track one and half or two are very much still linked to the top leaders. And that's why we often have talked about the need to involve other levels in the talks, to prepare the ground for top leaders to follow. And that's when we have the track three talks next time, when we talk about what grassroots activism can lead to, what can be done from below. It's also a challenge, it's not easy. I mean, but there is an international bias that we always tend to believe that top leaders first agree and then peace trickles down. But many times, also in this conflict, it trickles up. Ideas have been tested a long time before it reaches top leaders. Top leaders have the problem of also not taking in new ideas. It takes a long time. They are very rigid. A person like Arafat, we tried to get him to read one page only about an idea concerning one of the issues in the conflict. But he doesn't devote time for them, just put it aside. I have my idea on how it should be solved. <laughs> so top leaders can be very rigid and difficult, and they're only ready to compromise when the public really pressures from below. So that's what we're going to talk about next time. So it, I think it's almost 12, so it's an open for some question, comments, critique. That isn't that... Sorry? No. Top uh, route one, they can't really show the, their soft side on securities because they have to stay in power and control the uh, the people. Uh, kind of yeah, they're very afraid. That's that's why also 
John Burton and Sal said, it's better to have track two because then they can elaborate much more on the underlying needs mm. to why they have But why, why do they make public the track, all of the track, uh, all of the negotiations when it comes, when it gets signed over to track uh, the leaders and stuff? I mean, do you understand what I mean? Why it became public? Uh, no, I mean, like you, you, you talk about how, how there's lots of stuff they ag agreed on much, much further into yeah. the talks. But when it comes to the track... Because the leaders and the politicians and parliaments and so on, they are not always keen to go that far. Okay. If you have a broad public pressure, mm. then you tend to much easier come to an agreement by the top leaders. But if you don't have it, when, when publics believe it's not possible to make peace with the other side, politicians don't, are not daring people. They're very much more um, like what politicians are. I want to stay in power, I don't want to lose it in the next election, so better be careful. Mm. There you have the problems with the track one. I have a tiny question to Hamas, because um, they, they came quite recently together with, uh, with yeah. Fatah, I think, and um, would, what you said that Hamas agreed <coughs> that in case uh, Palestinian people in this referendum would decide, to have a two-state two uh, solution, however it would look like, and they would give up arms maybe, or um, however it would look like, I don't know. That was quite recent, right, what you what you said. So do you think there's... No. No? The, the well, acceptance of a two-state solution based on a referendum, I mean, the idea to go for a two-state solution within Hamas came already in 2006, oh, okay. even further before, within the movement itself, before it became public by Marshall in 2006. The referendum proposal came in 2010. Oh, okay. But what brought them together now? Why, why are they coming? Uh well, why Fatah and Hamas reconciled? Well, they made an attempt in 2011 mm -hmm. by pressure from below, hunger striking youth in the context of the Arab Spring. Uh, there came a more serious attempt in 2012, but no one didn't want to go to elections and lose it, so nothing happened. Then they had a joint government in 2014 for some time, but de facto no change. This is maybe the uh, last attempt in trying to, to come forward in a more serious reconciliation where, where Hamas basically gives in. And one of the reasons is that the public is not trusting any Palestinian leader anymore, neither Fatah Hamas or anyone else. Another one that all the wars cost also for Hamas, and the end people ask for Hamas to, to deliver in, in livelihood capacities. And uh, some also say that the Qatar issue, where the headquarter has been for Hamas, yeah. Qatar has big problems with the Gulf states and Egypt, and Trump, uh, in contrast to Barack Obama and um, George Bush, um, is not interested in the same way to isolate Hamas. So they have asked, it seems, the Egyptians to mediate. Because the president of Egypt hates Hamas, but all of a sudden they are ready to negotiate and facilitate. So Hamas gives in in, in many ways here. But they have not given in the army yet, or their forces. It's one, still one of the key issues. Oh, it's over lunchtime. Thank you.